Um, as I stated, the RMF produces a report which looks at mining companies, and that report is available on their web page. Pia, my question to you is, when I go onto the RMF's report and I look at a company's performance, what should I be taking away from that report? How should I be interpreting what you guys are doing? Great. Uh, thank you, Ms. Uman, and uh, hi, everyone. Um, I think in the context of this event, I'd like to share three key aspects of the mining report, the RMI report, Responsible Mining Index report, uh, which we publish every two years. Uh, I think first, the RMI report and, and all our research in general is available for free as a public good in seven languages. The methodology is fully transparent, uh, which means everyone's got access to all the indicators, the metrics, the scoring framework, and also to examples of uh, relevant kinds of evidence that one can expect. And the results themselves are also fully available. So meaning that everyone can dig down to every single indicator for every single company and mindset assessed. And because uh, like Masuma said, this is an evidence-based assessment, uh, every single score must be supported by evidence and data. And we've, all, uh, we've made them all available in an online document library. So that represents around 4,000 source documents of which 20% uh, were actually not publicly available before the release of the results and were submitted during the process. Uh, second, this is not a materiality exercise. So unlike many, to not say most, standards, guidelines, uh, rating agencies, frameworks, etc., which look at responsible mining through a materiality lens, uh, the RMI framework uses a salience lens and articulates what society in general expects from a responsible mining company and its operations. So in other words, the starting point are the potential impacts that mining can have on economic, environmental, social and governance issues and how companies are uh, assessing and addressing all these impacts rather than leaving it to the company or investors to decide what is material and what they should focus on. So this way you can really limit risk and build trust on a much broader and more robust spectrum. Uh, and finally, a third point I'd like to mention is our focus on mindset level or asset level data. Um, so most of our indicators are applied at the corporate level with three categories called commitment, action, and effectiveness. Uh, which in a way is just reflecting good management practices to deliver continuous improvement, like plan, do, check, act uh, with different words. Uh, so basically from having formalized the policy and assigned responsibility, accountability to the development and implementation of plans, management standards, protocols, guidelines, toolboxes, et cetera, uh, and ultimately to performance tracking, ongoing review, performance audits, uh, followed by corrective action plans, new targets, and so on. Uh, and most of these indicators include a community engagement dimension, which we will discuss later on. But uh, we also select between 200 and 300 mine sites across the globe and assess them individually against 15 very basic indicators. And actually, these are the indicators you can find in, in our mine site assessment tool, uh, which I'll talk about more later, which is a tool that was developed by affected communities and mine workers themselves. And these indicators look at very basic aspects of mining with for all of them a combination of data disclosure and evidence of stakeholder engagement and collaborative planning and decision making. And all of this is in a disaggregated way at the mine site level. Uh, and I'd like to finish by saying that the extremely low scores that we've seen across the board since our first report in 218 uh, on this mine site level assessment, uh, which is not included in the rankings we do, by the way, uh, are, are quite striking. And we know that it is at the operational level that the greatest impacts happen, and which is also why more and more regulators, shareholders, investors, banks, capital providers are now asking for site specific information. So we anticipate that there will be a stronger and stronger, stronger focus on this uh, in the future. Thank you. Yeah, that's quite interesting because you guys tend to take an assessment based report. Um, I'm, I'm going to bring Rebecca Burton into this. Uh, Rebecca, I'm, I'm glad you're there. Yeah. Um, we were with the Irma audit, 
uh, which is now you, I believe, have two audit reports out. Um, and again, this is a publicly available tool. Um, when I read the audit report from Irma, for example, what can I take from it? What can my understanding of what a company does be based on the audit report that Irma produces? Certainly. First, I just want to check you can hear me. Great. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> and thank you for all the help on the tech side. So what can you expect from an audit report? I think the most important thing is actually to start a little bit at the beginning, if I can, with Irma. And I'll get, just give you 10 seconds on what I mean by that, which is um, the background of Irma is really that it's the first multi-stakeholder definition of what responsible mining means. And what I mean by that is that for 10 years, starting in 2006, five stakeholder groups came around the table, mining companies, purchasers of mine materials, labor, impacted communities and nonprofits came together and worked for over a decade to define what does it mean to mine responsibly. And so that resulted in what is the IRMA standard for responsible mining, which is applicable to large scale mining, all mined materials, the world over and all geographies. So that's the important thing to know when we talk about our audit report, what it's actually being measured against. So the third party, the audit report is an objective third party analysis of a mine's performance against that standard. It starts with a desk audit and then there's also an on site audit, which includes what is pretty normal for most audits, which is visiting the mine and having interviews with management. What's different from other audits is that workers are interviewed separately from management. Government agencies are interviewed, nonprofits are interviewed and surrounding communities are interviewed. And it really is the only audit report that includes all of these perspectives. So that's the important context to understand. So the audit report itself is about a hundred page document. It talks about how the mine scores on each and every requirement in the standard. There's about 400 of them. It speaks specifically to how it meets each requirement, whether fully, substantially, partially or not. And then that actually results in a score. And the score is from one to 100. And we deliberately chose to do a scoring method rather than a pass fail approach because we feel that the scoring method really allows the mind to show improvement over time. It allows stakeholders to ask for specific changes um, and really allows uh, stakeholders, whether clients, investors, communities to really dig in and understand what's happening at the mine site. And so when you look at that report, you're going to see all of the measurements of how the mine performed requirement by requirement, and you'll see many other details as well. You'll see the corrective action plans that they have, the timing of the next audit, the location, the details of where the mine is situated, details about the mine itself, list of the mine workers interviewed, the, the communities interviewed. So you've got everything there in full transparency. So. In brief, the audit report really gives you the most holistic view of a mine's performance that you're likely ever going to see. Um, and certainly more than is what's available out there. It's a really an unprecedented level of transparency. And so it really helps both a client or investor understand the overall performance of the mine, or they can dig down and understand on particular areas, how is the mine performing? Um, it also allows other stakeholders, such as communities, to look and say, where are there, uh, where do we want changes, where do we want improvements, and specifically to point to the report as a verified analysis of how the mine has, has performed and ask for changes based upon that. So that's that's the, what you can find in the Irma audit report. <laughs> uh, that, that was a lot of information. And what <laughs> I enjoyed about both you and Pierre's comments is verification. Evidence-based seems to be a key factor in what both of you are describing. But these are, if I will call them private governance measures, which brings me to Pamela, who is more comfortable with, let's say, the public governance or, you know, governance, governance in the olden days. And I am curious, Mamela, we, we seem to have been handing over assessments to the private sector, whether, whether civil society or initiatives. But what about regulations themselves? What are the pros and cons of using the regulatory tools when it comes to looking at community engagement and company performances? No, um, good point. Very good point. And actually, I feel a little bad because even though I am comfortable with other parts in the world, for this example, I'm going to mainly address Europe. 
uh, because it's most pertinent there. And so in the European context, at least, Europeans tend to defer to legislation. They look to government to protect them, to ensure their interests. And when we think of these different public governance engagement measures, they're not just at the local level. They actually start at the international level. So you have the Aarhus Convention and you have that about transparency and about access to information. You have the ESPU Convention, which is about transboundary EIA, and it has very detailed requirements as to public consultation. And this is tricky because often it's in two countries that these impacts are happening. And then you have the EU level. And you have directives at the EU level, and then you have the member state level. And in mining, you even have the regional level in many places. Since mining is a member state competence and sometimes actually um, delegated down to the regions. So if we look at pros and cons, perhaps the pros are that there are many opportunities for public engagement and public consultation. One of the cons is there are many opportunities for public engagement and consultation. So the complexity, complexity is difficult because there are many, many different consultation procedures that um, that you can be involved in. And what we actually saw, for example, if we look at um, just at the country level in Finland, in Finland, the EIA process and the permitting process are consecutive. And so people often had no idea whether they were in the EIA public consultation hearing or in the permitting consultation hearing. And the comments they submitted weren't relevant much of the time because they didn't realize where they were. And so then they felt as if they weren't heard and the system wasn't working and all of that. Um, so in just a couple of pros, I think at least if this is codified in legislation, it gives a systematic way um, of implementing these things, you know, there'll be a certain level of compli uh, consultation. You know, it will happen that this is required. But I think as we've been hearing, there's a gap in how these are actually implemented and played out on the ground. And this is where private governance is often coming into play. And in Europe, it's a bit more of a problem because people really do look to governance. So there's there's a gap that needs to be filled. That that brings me very nicely to Liesl, who's been stuck in that gap, I'm presuming, for part of her career. Because Liesl has had to work with regulations and companies and community engagements. But Liesl, I'm going to try and force you to give us a little bit of a company perspective, because some of us have suffered through reading annual sustainability reports in our careers. And my question is, what are companies thinking when they're developing or reporting on these? Because they're self-assessments. And we seem to be very doubtful of when companies report on how good they are. Um, could you talk us through a little bit of what these annual sustainability reports represent to a company? What are they trying to convey? What are they thinking about? Thank you, Suma. Um, if you allow me, first of all, um, today is a public holiday in South Africa. It's Freedom Day. So um, I would like to take a few seconds to say in this context, um, may our endeavours bring uh, freedom of accessing information to all levels of stakeholders. Um, and I, I think um, collectively that is our intention, is how do we, how do we package and uh, regularise and standardise different types of information for different stakeholder groups? From a mining company point of view, there is no other instrument than the public sustainability reports or integrated reports. And if I can predict something soon to be replaced by the public ESG portal, um, uh, that um, shows this, um, I almost want to say conundrum of uncertainty between different levels of reporting and obligations than that public sustainability report. First of all, a company would choose uh, a, a set of standard or standards to follow. Very often, it's a very well-known GRI standard. What is very positive about a GRI standard is that they have materiality engagements on different levels. Um, from my experience, however, it's very seldom that those very, very local voices are heard in the glossy reports that, um, as you so rightly said, you have to struggle through. Um, so that's one aspect of a sustainability report. You choose your standard. 
And then um, you choose your structure, you choose which other um, instruments you want to show compliance to. And for each instrument you choose, you have a different stakeholder group in your back, in the back of your mind, uh, mind. Maybe you choose the quite new mining local procurement reporting mechanism, you want to show that. It might be that um, where your um, sites are operating, there was recent local procurement legislation um, promulgated. So you want to illustrate what you're doing. Um, whereas, uh, I might be quite, uh, I might be on the cynical side as someone who has both produced and audited those reports. So I've been on both sides of the, of the equation. Um, my take on it is that in public reporting, we are trying to please everyone and look good. And can't we spend that time and money better? Um, really, uh, drilling down into uh, can every stakeholder group have a two-way conversation with the mine in real time, both from the investor re level, who is more and more interested and who mining companies will less and less in the future be able to fool with very aggregated and high level um, materiality reporting. Investors are becoming, uh, are asking the difficult questions. Have you seen the court case, for example, have you seen the court case that told the mining company to talk to um, individual stakeholders and not traditional chiefs, for example? But those are the kind of questions that investors will increasingly ask. So, um, my, uh, there's a question mark for me about the relevance in the long term of a company published sustainability report. Um, yes, comply to your financial reporting requirements. What I'm also seeing is that stock, ex stock exchanges are more starting to drive what they're asking for, for ESG reporting. So there's definitely a shift happening. Um, often, um, it's the it's the regulation that spur the company to action. We need to tick that box. We need that permit. Next level is the audit, uh, and whether it's required by um, different investors, application for finance, whatever spurs the audit. The audit will often provide the roadmap to good practice. Mm -hmm. But then, for the ones who don't have access to those audit reports. A report like what BIA is, is publishing provides wider society with deeper insight. They don't have access to um, maybe privy, privy support uh, reports and, and drill down information. And then um, finally, um, my the one question that remains for me is, if I look at mining in Africa where my experience lies, um, the actual local stakeholders Often, all these reports are opaque to them. They're in a language they don't understand. They take 30 megabytes of data to, to download this report. And then it uses a, a language of ESG that is completely foreign to a like, or local stakeholder. So, um, I'm not to lead you into your next question, but that asks, who are we reporting for and why? No, but that does lead me very nicely into the next question, which I'll, I'll, I'll ask you to start off, because evidence and information is also a matter of trust. Like you said, if companies are feeling like they only need to show how well they're doing, there's a little bit of a trust deficit because they assume their investors will clamp down hard if they are bad without understanding this is an improvement process. And at the same time, communities who are not being able to access this information at some point are going to say, why are we giving this information to assessors where we don't trust what our information is used for? In your experiences of the various trust deficits that do exist, what do you think is one of the biggest hindrances in getting good evidence, good communication out on, on community engagement by companies? Um, Masiva, 
the first thing that I often find, find lacking when I do uh, advisory work on stakeholder engagement is a very basic thing. It is key messages. Mm -hmm. It sounds like, how could we have missed this? But what it causes if you don't have it, if you don't have consistent messaging in your communities, and when you send in your consultants to do all your regulatory processes, they, do, they also don't have. The community member who sees the consultant walking up, they don't distinguish between a EIA and a surface lease agreement and an ownership um, consultation. Not at all. They see a representative of the mine. And very often, those representatives of the mine, whether they are mine employees or consultants, they don't sing from the same hymn book. Yeah. That's the first, first and foremost factor that breaks down trust on ground level. Um, the second one, I would say, is um, uh, unresolved legacy issues and grievances. Mm -hmm. um, people who are not heard, grievances that are not closed out um, in a timely fashion and within a good practice framework, that does a lot of damage. Um, yeah, so let me stick with two for now. Um, and that company community trust deficit. Okay, um, from from com company community, Pamela, if I could sort of come back to you, because you did make that interesting comment about how we trust governments, at least in Europe, we do, we do trust our governments most of the time. <laughs> um, um, but how do we address the, it is a complex thing procedurally knowing what is happening, what, like you said, is it EIA, is it community, whatever. Do you think there is a general level of trust between communities and governments in Europe, at least, where they're like, okay, do your thing G generally, because I know there are regions in Europe that say no mining and are trying to force their governments or regional governments to say, we do not want mining projects. And that's a very, very different uh, particular aspect of that. But generally, between communities, companies, and governments, is there a trust deficit or does something need to be improved? Um, how are we doing on the information that we're given? Good question and a complex one, actually. Um, you know what, I will answer this. Can I just step back? Because it, what struck me is the term ESG, it is so common. And yet, at least in the Miriu project, we had 17 partner regions across Europe. The only, only region this ever came up in is Cornwall. Only in the UK is ESG used, not in any of the other countries, which really struck me as to, okay, why? And are we having different conversations in some way? Um, and also actually the question of assessments in Europe. What is the relevance of assessments in Europe and what is the role that they play given given um, the strong governance and given people look to governance. And so as to your your questions about trust, uh, so we had to come up with EU level SLO, social license to operate guidelines. And the one question that came up early on and forever is how do you standardize something in Europe? It is so heterogeneous, it is so different. But that said, we actually looked at individual values and then we looked at how that affects attitudes towards governance and how that affects attitudes toward mining. And really, at the end of the day, we still found that in general, Europeans want government to govern. They do not want private companies to govern. And we have two examples, and I'm thinking of third party assessments here. So both Finland and Spain in different ways implemented the Canadian towards sustainable mining program. These are really early, early days. So, you know, in some ways, take this with a grain of salt. But in neither case, do we really see this being effective in terms of garnering acceptance on the societal level? In Finland, with the Tel Aviv disaster, everyone came together and realized they have to figure a way forward together for the mining industry, how to build trust in the industry and how to rebuild trust in government. And this network approach of all interested stakeholders is really an interesting model and it worked really well and they adopted the TSM and then it went under the uh, Finnish Mining Association. 
but there was very little outreach to the broader society. So we see a long implementation period of companies and we see momentum being lost and people are saying, all right, so you did all of this great work and it is great work, but what, what's the outcome of this? How are things getting better? In Spain, they actually adopted the TSM through a national standard. It's, it is early days, but even the companies are having a hard time understanding how it's going to help them. It's expensive, it's cumbersome. A lot of these are junior mining companies without the resources. So I think the role that 30 part, third party assessments play in Europe is very different, let me say. I think it's necessary, I think it's essential in many ways, but how you build trust in actually the assessment process itself, I think is the big question, to be honest. Is it needed? Excellent, which, which, which brings me immediately to Rebecca because she's been trying to build trust by companies into third party processes. I like the work, you know, how this is smoothly flowing around. Rebecca, question to you then, because you've been doing this with Irma and I can, I can imagine mining companies going, whoa, we do not want to be audited and we certainly don't want it to be publicly available until we can, you know, take a look at the results. How has this progressed with Irma trying to convince companies to get it done? Tell us, tell us all about your problems with these companies. <laughs> okay, well, I'll touch on a couple of points, which you just said, which is in terms of the mining companies themselves. So first of all, yes, the report is actually not published before the mining company has a chance to review it. So that's the first step. The, when the audit reports, when the third party auditor is finished with the report, that's handed to the company, they actually have, and then they have a chance to review it. And there's actually a 12 month period allowed after they get the results of the audit reports that if they want to go back and actually make changes in the operations and have those particular changes re audited, they can do so and then release the audit report. So in that way, it actually does take away, I think, some of that, wow, you're asking so much of me, um, because there is this way to work within the auditing system that makes sense in terms of this level of transparency that we're asking is completely new. And so how do we meet a mining company where they're at to both be transparent and ultimately to drive toward our mission, which is to improve mining. And so if you allow those 12 months for changes to be made, um, it actually does improve practices at the mine site, which is the ultimate aim of the audit anyway. So that's one way that trust is built. Um, I think that, you know, this question about junior mining companies and the relevance of IRMA, we've actually been really responsive to that. We have an IRMA ready standard that is currently um, about to come out under consultation. So this, these are all of the parts of IRMA that a mining company could meet before they act, before they actually develop a mine. And so they could actually, for a junior mining company, pass the mine off to a mine developer with this IRMA ready certificate already attached to say we've done the work that needs to be done in advance. So I think this idea of being really um, responsive to what the mining companies need is also really important. Um, and then in terms of just building confidence generally, uh, I think that's a broader question here, Masuma, that you're asking. In, and I just love what Liesl said about a two-way conversation. I think that is so important and it's so true. And we believe that transparency is the first stage of that. And so once you have these audit results that I described that provide so much depth, it actually allows the difficult questions that Liesl said the investors are asking to actually be asked by everyone, right? And so they can ask the difficult questions and that two-way conversation between each stakeholder can happen. The purchaser to the mining company, the community to the mining company. It allows for an authentic dialogue that we just haven't had to date because the information hasn't been publicly available. And then I would just say, uh, I'll just touch on really quickly in terms of how do you build trust with communities, at least for us, it's the level of transparency that that is provided. So it's before an audit is noticed, um, sorry, before an audit takes place, it is publicly noticed. We actually do active outreach to communities. And then during the audit, like I talked about, they're interviewed and then they've got the results following the audit as well. And then it's actually also in Irma's governance structure that goes to how we build trust with not only communities, but all of the other stakeholders, whether it be mining companies or purchasers. And what I mean by that is that Irma is governed by those five stakeholder groups that gathered around the table originally to define the standard for responsible mining. And so to this day, 
you have those five stakeholder groups that govern Irma equally, meaning that they each not only have an equal vote, but actually a decision cannot go forward in Irma unless it has the yes from each of the two representatives from the stakeholder groups of mining, purchasing, labor, NGOs, and communities. So it's seeing a system where the, your interests are represented, I think is also really important. So I'll end there. Um, thank you, which, which brings me to Pierre, because you, the RMF also has a similar issue in convincing companies because you also ask for documents and companies need to provide their documents on sustainability, human rights procurements, which is part of the evidence there. And so Pierre, I'm, I'm curious about two things. One is how do you get companies to trust you? And the second is you go through commitment and you also go through action. How is that trust built? I mean, you and I, well, okay, probably you more than me. We can read a company document and we can say, okay, this is what this document says. Oh, I can see the missing gaps. But when it comes to implementation, it almost sounds like it's a matter of choice or belief. And how do I trust RMF's assessment of action and implementation? Thanks, uh, Ms. Uma. I think, uh, again, trying to be brief, but, uh, I think first, when it comes to you know trust with companies, relationship with companies, uh, in our case, you know we do not seek their authorization. They don't pay us. We select them based on scale, geographic criterion. Uh, we try to level the playing field, and we assess them. We apply the same indicators whether the company company is publicly listed, privately owned, state owned, regardless of the commodity uh, commodities extracted, and we only ask public interest information which ought to be in the public uh, domain, but that's our rational. Uh, so you can imagine at first, many companies were skeptical or, or reluctant to the idea of a, of a fully independent and, and public assessment. Right? We're not funded by the industry and we're not a multi-stakeholder initiative where, where the industry plays a prominent role uh, and where um, I think Rebecca, you know, where we're making changes and decisions can, can take you know, such a long time and be so, sometimes very slow. Uh, but years after years, we've seen the, um, the relationship with companies evolve. Uh, and I think this is exactly this independence and in our capacity to articulate society expectations into practical metrics and bring to the forefront the concerns of directly affected stakeholders uh, that gives value to our results and our tools. Also, you won't find many methodologies around that look at economic development, for example and how or to what extent companies take into account uh, socioeconomic priorities, development plans of producing countries when they make the business and investment decisions. Uh, and I think to your point, Pamela, I, I think this is one of, if not the only way to rehabilitate the importance and relevance of mining and perhaps even more in regions like Europe or areas with a long history of anti-mining uh, movements. And this is much, I think, appreciated, you know, this, this independence, this, this vast, breadth of issues. This is appreciated by a growing number of companies, uh, which often have, have their shoulder to the wheel and, and like these kinds of external and independent insights. And because all the evidence is publicly available, it helps build credibility and trust among stakeholders. Uh, and, and this is really not a matter of being, you know, of RMI being better than Irma or the copper mark or better gold and so on, but really for, for both investors, shareholders, capital providers, and on the ground communities and workers, they want to have informed conversations and collaboration that are not just based on companies narrative and storytelling, but on facts, raw data, evidence. And having been a mining engineer myself, I mean, I, I need to say that I know that there are limits to audits, limits to what you can assess, understand, discover within one, two, three weeks uh, versus spending one, two years on site. Uh, we even have good friends, you know, who are academics. They spend three years at one site to just understand the social dynamics and power plays within what we call local communities. But what what are those local communities? And and with all the respect we have for audit firms and and certifications, uh, I think we know they're only part of the answer to the trust deficit and the bad reputation of the mining industry. You, you can't just transfer this trust deficit to a third party uh, and tell local stakeholders, look, you didn't trust us, but now we got certified, we can trust them. If yeah. there's no evidence and transparency, 
integrated in this process. And I think, you know, Oma is, is clearly, you know, making a, a, the right step forward, but we think even if the audit report is 100 page long, uh, it needs probably more than that. You know, you have human rights due diligence guidelines, assessment templates, survey results. Well, make them public, and then we can have a conversation. And that's what we're trying to push for. So integrating meaningful transparency and collaboration into every aspects of mining instead of piles and piles of ad hoc ESG reporting and, and tick boxing. Uh, um, Pierre, I appreciate that you're adding to my reading list by saying these reports should be longer. You know? Well, hey, I don't know. Let's see how long. It's not much going. about reporting, but really about transparency, know, about like documenting, topic. documenting your actions. But, but and there is something that you just sort of said. I mean, you know, if you start counting off third party assessments, whether they're civil society or independent initiatives, I'm also wondering about communities and community fatigue. Because honestly, if I'm walking down the road and the guy with the clipboard comes and says, do you have five minutes for a survey? I, I cross the road. <laughs> How are you with, with RMF dealing with community fatigue or community engagement where, you know, I'm sure the community has other things to do as well. Oh, yes, <laughs> that's a very good point. Uh, and again, we, we don't have all the answers, of course. Um, and, and this varies a lot between regions, uh, social backgrounds, context. Uh, uh, but we've heard from many communities this frustration and, and I think disappointment that has been generated by a number of initiatives, projects that only sought to sort of share some ready-made information tools, do a bit of knowledge transfer, a couple of pilots, write the report and then leave the region afterwards. Um, the community engagement and support, we think, must be a bottom-up approach, like demand-driven since its inception. You don't simply just come, give a tool, leave. Uh, but you need to integrate longer term capacity building that makes sense to affect people on the ground so that ultimately local communities or mine workers or labor unions are driving the process themselves, that they exercise civic space, they exercise their own agency. And, and this is a very long process, right? So <laughs> that requires you know, besides local translation, local partners, networks, insights, that also requires financial support. Uh, and, and this is, I think, a huge challenge because some companies, which are really willing to enable this, this level of deep and, and real collaboration, collaborative decision-making, planning, they can also face this issue. You know, how do you cover people's expenses and their income loss because they've not been at work, or uh, they couldn't be on the, at the farm for this day of workshop or a multi-stakeholder forum, given that you have your own anti-bribery policies and you don't want to appear to be co-opting, you know, those local actors. Uh, and we think this is why an independent sort of facilitator is important, but again, essential to keep it bottom up and not impose agenda and priorities. And this is where we, we this is how we came up with our, our mindset assessment tool, which I, I mentioned before, a set of very basic sort of plain language uh, engagement question to trigger the dialogue and discussion, and these were designed by by local stakeholder. I think this is this is key. It's part of the answer, but uh, it's a uh, it's a good part of the answer. Thanks, um, Lisa. I'd like to bring you in on that uh, because we've had previous conversations about how uh, how communities differ, how we use technology. You've just talked about how language is different. Community fatigue. What, what? What's? How does that affect assessment? And what? What can we do better not to abuse communities? Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I was listening to Pierre, and I think, yes, yes, and I've seen that. Yes, so, so completely identify with what you're saying, Pierre. Um, just to give you a practical example, at at one point, um, uh, engagement process that I was involved on. From from the from the overarching point of view, at one point there was four different consultancies having to, by regulation, um, engage with communities on different topics, and this was all fixed to regulated timelines. So it wasn't even as if the mine could say, "Oh, let's just suck it up, let's just." It had to be done. It was chaos. And then another point that uh, Pia brought up that I think is very relevant in um, in Africa, where I work, especially, um, is people lose income while while attending five meetings a day. 
in, in certain countries, there's a stipulated per diem that you, that you give someone if they come and attend the meeting, it covers their lunch, it covers their transport. Um, but that becomes a very sticky issue when you zoom out to the G of ESG and look at governance and bribery and corruption. So that brings me to that disconnect be between what we think is good practice in our offices in, 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 um, in Europe or America or even in Johannesburg and what really, what would really constitute good practice? What would really um, give a stakeholder the, the confidence and sometimes the full tummy to participate. That, that's the reality of where a lot of the minds are situated. It, 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 is, it is not a comfortable setting. Um, then the other point that Pierre make, makes that I want to reiterate, um, in my experience over the years, mining communities are becoming, and that's a very collective term, just bear with me, we don't have time to, <laughs> um, uh, becoming increasingly more sophisticated in the questions that they ask because they are better connected with, even if it's with, with Facebook, with a more informed, et cetera. And they also have more support from non-governmental associations. Um, however, there is a need when you come with a very technical co uh, consultation on a tailings facility and you start using upstream and downstream um, terms that engineers even have to explain to me very carefully, the need for capacity building, the uh, building up the basic knowledge um, base of the rural community that you are coming um, to serve. Which brings me to my last point is that is why are we not bringing stakeholder engagement into the 21st century and the fourth industrial revolution? We have videos, we have animations, we have virtual reality for that matter. It could be invaluable. We have 3D printing. It could be invaluable tools to first do a very um, enjoyable and interactive capacity building session before you um, stand up and want to engage and get collaborative decision making on a very technical topic. That's good, uh, which which takes me to Pamela. And I'm, I'm going to push you on the communication and community engagement issue from a different legacy issues, because Finland has had experiences and we know a number of European countries have had legacy issues. How do you build that trust and community fatigue? You know, community has already been through a horror story. 20 years, you know, whether it's 20 years, 30 years, whenever. How does that, is the community fatigued about talking about mining just because they had to spend two generations dealing with something which was a disaster in their region at some point? Um, you know, I hadn't actually thought of it from that angle in terms of different generations. I mean, in Finland, what we are seeing uh, is that it's really Talvivada, which was in 2012, which is uppermost in people's minds. So it's not multi-generational, but I do have to say people are, they're not just tired of talking about it. They're tired of not seeing anything different happening. They're not tired of not seeing results. And I think if they did see something changing, it would be different. Uh, and then I was thinking about, gosh, Romania and Eastern Europe and how different you know, that whole context is. And with legacy issues, it's in those countries, there isn't a whole lot of conversation going on. There is just no mining, period. That is it. So I think legacy affects people in very, very different ways. Um, and you know, from what I have seen, they're actually, there are more examples of perhaps government-led community fatigue, if I could put it that way, in Europe than company-led community fatigue. And I think because, again, since I work in Finland, this is what's uppermost in my mind, but having these long, drawn-out procedures that are not in parallel like they are in Sweden, but they're consecutive, I, it just, the conversation goes on and people don't really see you know, the point any more engaging because the other part to that is, if it is legally, I mean, if you can legally open the mine, honestly, 
it doesn't really matter what the community say. The government will go ahead and approve the permits. And so there's also this idea of, does it really matter what we're saying? Because legally they will go ahead. And so, so there are so many different facets to this. Sorry, I'm not hunting on on, on one. No, but it, it is an interesting aspect of, because all, all three of you or four of you have been talking about that this community engagement is a long drawn out process, you know, of, of spending three years with the community or sort of community mandated engagement through regulations. And there's a question in my head which sort of asks, is this process always slated to be a long one? Can the burden from communities in some way be reduced by making this shorter? Is it just because we've now in the last five years seriously engaged with processes that look at community engagement and you know we're still learning to fasten this up? Or is this one of those areas where it always will be a you can't do it quickly. If you're going to do it well, you can't do it quickly. You know, we had discussed and you had wanted me to talk about BAPE, but that's exactly what the mission of BAPE is. And, and maybe I will say that to later. But there, yes, there are ways this can be sped up and there can be a government agency that takes on these this role, basically, as pre-negotiating all of these differences. Now, again, this is in the Canadian context. But I also want to say in the Canadian context, context, and it's my last example, that there are times you can never have too much consultation. And in a sense, so in Canada, in Ontario, um, very, maybe 20 years ago, exploration companies were having to spend longer and longer times engaging First Nations, and it was taking a long time. And the Canadian government wanted to incentivize exploration as well, and they were worried this would disincentivize all of these smaller companies. So what they ended up doing was creating um, basically a whole program in the tax code that makes public engagement a legitimate tax deduction. And they came up with this other investor flow through share scheme, which is really interesting and complicated. I'm not sure I understand it. Um, but basically having people be able to invest in exploration and then it's also tied to engagement and, and legitimate expenses and needing your due diligence so you can maintain other stuff. But Canada's figured out a way to try to have a win-win situation, uh, incentivize engagement while incentivizing exploration. So if you have populations who are willing to do this, there are there are solutions out there. Okay, um, I'm going to throw one last question and Rebecca, and then we're going to come to the questions in the field. Um, Rebecca, same sort of question to you: community engagement, timelines, fatigue. How how is Irma approaching these things? Sure. I mean, I think just everything that Pierre and Liesel and Pamela have said has resonated so much. There was a comment that a community leader made on a meeting that I was in that was so poignant and he basically just spoke to the fact that communities are being asked to attend all of these meetings when they may want to be spending time with their families tending their crops and essentially they become involuntary volunteers right to it's to step up and whether it be to participate in an audit or potentially monitor mine performance and if you think of the latter monitoring the mine performance, his particular concern was our communities actually being to asked to play the role that the state or regulatory agents should be playing. And I think that's a really valid concern. And I think something that, that we've all spoken to in, in one way or another. So in terms of the way that Irma handles it and the way that we try to make the lift as light as possible is that I spoke earlier to the fact that we publicly um, notice when an audit is going to happen. So that occurs, and yes, we say on our website, this audit is forthcoming, but we definitely go much further than that because we certainly don't expect communities and NGOs to be monitoring our website for any of those announcements. So we do the proactive engagement to understand who, need, who in the community actually needs to be um, consulted during this audit process. And then we reach out to them in advance. We explain what IRMA is, how it's different, how it's governed, what the results will be. And so it's a, it's a lot of training and conversations for the audit. So then the audit occurs, the report comes out. And what I'll say is um, just in terms of sort of that level of transparency that we're able to offer through a mine audit um, and that 100 pages that I talked about is that, the, like I said, the community can really dive in. So we actually just finished an audit in Zimbabwe, the Unki mine by Anglo-American. 
And ZELA, who is the Zimbabwe Environmental Law Association, they're a public interest environmental organization working to protect the rights of communities there. They published an article about that report coming out and said it was actually titled Anglo American Under the Microscope to the point of detail that was offered. Right. And so basically, Zella, we have we reached out to them in advance to make sure their voices are heard. And we've since held a number of meetings with them to explain the audit report exactly to get over this um, hurdle of what the definitions might mean, what the findings might mean, and really work with them to hear what their concerns may still be and to, in, and to ensure that they understand the results and that they understand the next steps. So I would say there can be a role, and it's a role that Irma takes on, there can be a role for the, for the body that is working to advance this certification to actually step in and make the lift lighter for communities in understanding the value that this level of transparency provides for them. So that's that's the approach that we take is really um, as, as many meetings as it takes both proactively before and after. Thank you, because I, I think that the, the debate sort of always is if there's an assessment, how good was the quality of data behind that assessment? And then how good was the consultation process? Um, sort of coming very quickly to the questions, um, I'll throw the first one at Pierre. Um, are there mining companies who publish their environmental and social data at the site level at this stage? Right, you... so there are very, very few companies do that. Uh, some companies do it uh, and have started putting more disaggregated information. Um, I guess the next step is going to be what kind of information they share. Uh, and again, is it limited to, you know, a couple of quantitative metrics? Like, you know, this is, uh, which, which is all fine and needed. Like, you know, how, just how many people work there? How many are contract worker versus permanent worker? monitoring you know water quality air pollution etc uh, but but this could be uh, uh, clearly expanded cool um the next question liesel i'll sort of direct towards you which is and, and we've talked about this within the panel in a previous conversation about grievance and complaint mechanisms and how they are also part of an assessment framework um in in your interactions with companies in the African context, how effective is that grievance mechanism, particularly when you're addressing legacy issues before new issues crop up? And Vasuma, that's a very relevant question. And it's, it's also something that's on the radar of good practice standards at the moment. Um, uh, I'm currently working with a, a client to make sure that vulnerability issues are addressed through the grievance mechanism. That, for example, um, voluntary principles of, secure, of security and human rights issues are addressed through the grievance me mechanism. So in an ideal world, it's a wonderful place in which to make sure that different stakeholders can voice um, their, um, their grievances, issues, et cetera, and that it's addressed within a in a very structured way. Um, what I what I see often, and and this this brings me to to a point, is when when I do a, 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 a due diligence or audit, I always ask, please send me your grievance policy, and then please send me your site level grievance mechanism or your register. And that gap is really and uh, evidence of that trust deficit we've talked about. Uh, what is um, uh, a, co a company standard on a corporate level, often in practice is very, very difficult to implement. Not impossible, but difficult. And it needs resources. If you really want that grievance mechanism to be accessible, you can't have the signboards up in English. You, you can't just have an email address. Mm -hmm. There needs to be a WhatsApp line. They, so so there's, there's a lot of very practical intricacies that comes into play when you talk about a effective grievance mechanism. When I look at a grievance register and I see um, uh, outstanding or open grievances, 
that have been there for years, two years, and 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 you look at the trends if you if you draw a report that um, the legacy ones aren't going down, then that's a red flag to me. Somewhere someone's not listening. Yeah. Um, somewhere there's not sometimes addressing a grievance means that you have to sit in three consecutive news meetings while someone voice their frustrations in an angry way. Sometimes that's what's needed, but that's not comfortable and that's hard for the community relations staff on the ground to do. And and, and often also um, difficult to explain up the corporate ladder. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Um, I'm sort of going to pick on the, one of the last questions that we have, uh, Pamela. There's one more for you, Rebecca, so don't don't think you can go away yet. Um, Pamela, and we've had this conversation before. This is about who takes leadership roles. Because I think, and this is a debate that we've been having in development studies since when I went to university, which was a long time ago, about whose responsibility. And that concept that civil society and private sector was starting to step into a space which should have been taken by the government. As we sort of move forward, and I like the term regulations, I like the le term level playing field, but we all know how difficult these things are to implement. You know, human resources, financial resources, capacity building all over. Eventually, I'm assuming government, but how far do you think we are from that leadership role, at least in the European context? I'm sorry. I think my son is coming home. So if you if you hear my dog, just tell me and I will go find my dog. Please, we always, cats and dogs are always welcome on these calls. <laughs> so you know what? I'm sorry. I, I just missed the last of your question because he was barking. Um, so, so my question basically is, in terms of leadership, how far away are we when governments take actual leadership and private be governance becomes a lower priority than public governance on these matters? How far are we from, I'm sorry, from what? From, so what we're talking with Irma and Liesl and Rebecca is how private governance is playing quite a major role in assessing companies on this. And it seems to be that space should have been taken by governments. And in some cases it has been, and in some cases it hasn't. Do you think we'll keep going like that? Or at some point will private governance drop off because it's all regulated anyways? Uh, I would need to think about that more, but for now, I would say it very much depends where you are. Now, as an American, I mean, Americans hate government. I mean, we just want government out. So do I think they're public yeah. government, government when it could, no, probably not. In Europe, um, I think Europe really actually is in a very you know, critical juncture with mining and there are a lot of tense debates. And I think if government does not step up and those are many layers of government, and if they do not play a bigger role in this and a facilitating role and really get more involved, um, I think private governance will absolutely try to fill the vacuum. I don't think it's going to be successful, though, and that's the concern. What happens? I mean, where is the governance in any place? Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, and I, I think that the, the role of government and governance also depends on, in general, people trusting trusting government. And I saw there was one question about COVID, and it made me think, gosh, in the era of COVID and people losing trust, at least in Europe, living in Belgium, <laughs> losing trust in government. Uh, you know, all of this is connected in some way. So I'm not sure I see government actually taking over in the long term, but I'm not sure who I see taking over. Um, but Pamela, this would be a good time to talk about the Canadian example of uh, babe. babe. Could, you, okay. could you just tell us quickly what that is as an agency, as an institution? Sure. Um, I won't, you know, terrify you with my French. It's the... <laughs> Before the Laurentians public something of the environment, but so it is in Quebec, and it is a quasi-governmental institution started about 35 years ago. Uh, it is funded by the government, and its whole mandate is to go and audit, in a sense, oversee the public consultation process in large-scale projects, projects needing to go through EIA, and these can be government-led projects or they can be private-led projects. It doesn't matter. But BAPE is known as being neutral, as being extremely co competent. They also have funding to go out to the local communities, roughly 
four times a year. So they maintain those connections in the communities. And over the decades, what has happened, they issue reports, they assess a project on the participation only, and they issue a report on how well this was conducted. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, they have filled a vacuum. So those negotiations between community and company, because both trust BAPE, what BAPE recommends ends up with being everyone buys off on. Okay. And in that way, you have you had asked earlier about kind of facilitating you know, processes, and it has actually made the permitting process faster because it takes out this back and forth, which is interesting. Which is interesting. I like the idea of facilitator rather than thinking about them in two camps. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Rebecca, I'm going to come to you with the last question before we do summation comments. Um, one of the... Th I've attended community consultation webinars and classes, et cetera, et cetera. And we all know there are 500 indicators that people want to talk about from free prior informed consent to which communities are saying yes, who's the stakeholder, yes, no, et cetera. But I also understand Irma went through the process of deciding what responsible sourcing looks like, responsible mining looks like, and what is included in that community engagement. Do you just want to briefly speak to sort of saying you can't please all of the people all of the time and the balance <laughs> you need to make in saying what we assess as community engagement and why trade-offs might be necessary in that assessment? Wow, um, <laughs> that's a big one. Um, why trade-offs are necessary? Um, I mean, I think ultimately, perhaps I would answer this in a different way, which is to say, when you have a multi-stakeholder con consultation and when everyone is around the table, each of the stakeholders decide which trade-offs they're willing to make. And perhaps that's actually the most important point of all of this, is that everyone needs to be around the table, giving their voice and deciding what needs to be included in this definition of responsible mining and what it, where can we find compromise? And as we went through the 10 year process, there was definitely a, you know, there were, we, we called them sticky issues, which um, actually it was water and waste. I think that we had the most issues with. And in those cases, what happened is that we actually moved the conversation to um, a professional group who, who, still represented those stakeholder groups around the table and had more experience in those particular topic areas and ultimately were able to make recommendations on what the actual requirements should be. And so I think what I'm just trying to say there is, do there necessarily need to be trade-offs? I'm not sure, but compromise, yes. And by having everyone's voice, I think that you so Irma, we talk about it's the most rigorous practice or best practice. That's what we seek to put out. And then it also has mining at the table saying, this is what's practicable for the market. This is what we can actually do on the ground. So I think, yeah, that, that's what I would say on that particular point. And can I just say two things really quickly on two prior questions? Um, one, I mean, Pierre and I, I think just, I just want to recognize RMS role in all of this, in the work that both of us are doing, are doing to bring transparency and Masuma, you asked about mine site level certification, and that's exactly what Irma is and that our audits are public. And I do hope and believe that those audits being public will then feed into the reporting that RMF does. Right? So we both come at it a different way. But ultimately, it really is about a transparent conversation. And again, the more information that you have, the more every stakeholder who is around the table is informed can have those important conversations. And then I'll just say one thing on this um, question uh, that I really appreciate Pamela's perspective on, and I'll just add to it in terms of this of government regulation. And so from the nonprofit sector, we hear often that one of the issues with voluntary certification is that it's voluntary and we certainly agree and we certainly see that it may just be that that basically there does need to be a level playing field and the government does need to come in at the same time we also hear from civil society as much as they want governments to step up and play the role they also actually recognize that voluntary systems and that the markets can be much more nimble 
And I'll just give an example of that, which I think is really powerful. So in Irma's system, at this time last year, there were six mines engaged using our self-assessment tool. And now there are 30 mining companies, sorry, not just mines, mining companies who are in the system and, and using Irma. And why did that happen? Well, it wasn't from government regulation. It was from purchasers of mined materials saying, this is the type of certification that we want you to go through. This is the type of information that we want. This is the level of transparency that we want. And those were market players who came out, BMW and Daimler, for example, both had very clear press releases that this will be something in our contracting and, and let the mining sector know. And so I guess what I'm just trying to say there is there's a certain fluidity and a certain quickness that the market can move in and can push change to be made. At the same time, we very much see our role having gone through 10 years of working through to get to that definition to say to governments, please use IRMA as you make regulation. Please look to this as a way where all of the, rep the, rep all of the um, different stakeholders that you seek to serve were around the table when the definition was made. And mm -hmm. so please use us as a template for improving practices and improving, regula uh, improving regulations and policies. So I just wanted to add those two points in terms of how we approach those questions. Thank you for those points, Rebecca, because I've, I've, I've got a list of notes and I was like, okay, how do I sum up this one hour? And it's an interesting contrast from all four, four panelists, because we are talking from Liesl's perspective where company communications, company messaging, which seems very simple and is yet so complicated from moving from that to what you and Pierre, Rebecca and Pierre work on, which is assisting companies in now, I be believe the buzzword, don't want to call it a buzzword, is evidence-based. Stop giving us nice little documents saying, hey, we care about the environment, show us. Show us your commitment, show us how you're putting this into action. While being aware that communities are not an unlimited resource, they also have other things to do. So we need to respect how we choose their time to bring them into this assessment process. To bring it back up to what Pamela has been talking about, how in certain countries and certain approaches, this is the government's job and the government is expected to do it. And they need to learn from what the private sector and the private governance bit of this is doing. So in answering the question of what are the tools and challenges for assessment from taking something that Irma and RMF are producing, which is documented, detailed evidence, to what Liesl has been talking about, not scaring companies that they only want to show what good they've done, but to be honest and bring out actual information to finally get to a point where it's like, oh yeah, they, they, they followed the EIA because I know my government checked on it. I can move on. I don't need to concern myself. It's a lovely spectrum. And I think it sort of shows us at least where a roadmap or a vision would be. To sort of the last question that I had prepared for my panelists was very simple. You found an oil lamp. You've sort of rubbed the lamp. There's a little genie that has come out. In terms of thinking outside the box, whatever you wish for, for tools and challenges with assessing company reporting on corporate performance, what what would be your one completely ridiculous or completely practical wish? Um, Pia, shall we start with you on that one? Since since you're the only gentleman on the panel, you know this time we'll change it around and say gentleman goes first. I like it. <laughs> Deconstructing <laughs> gender stereotypes is very important. Uh, it has to be one sentence, right? Uh, well, and perhaps to address, I see Andy Whitmore has a question here, but in one sentence, I think uh, it would be good to see mining companies, lobby groups, industry associations, governments uh, be really willing to rethink uh, community consultation, community involvement, the role of mining in our society, and in a way not focus too much about, like you said, Masuma, reporting on the positive contribution, but ensuring that you're not harming environments, people, biodiversity, cultural heritage in the first place. That should be at the heart of any responsible mining approach. Thanks. Cool. 
Um, Liesl, can I come to you next on, on Freedom Day? And thank you so much for speaking to us on your day off. That's a pleasure. <laughs> um, Ms. Dima, I have two keywords in my head and I'm going to try to use them properly, but I don't know if this is going to come out properly. In this multi-stakeholder environment, in my environment that is about hearing each other, yeah. my wish is that we can all, from all levels, move beyond the desperate need for consensus to the revelatory place of empathy and understanding of each other. Mm. Those are, that's a very good. I'll have to think about that one, Liesl. There might be a document you and I are writing in the next six months. Um, Rebecca, your so, wish. Sure. I would say my wish, you know, when I tell people that I work in this sector, I think most people don't even think about mining. So I think that my wish would be that there is a broader awareness of the fact that we all use mined materials every day that we rely on these even for this very call that we're having um, and probably the next steps that we'll be taking in our days today whether it's to get the warm cup of coffee or to drive somewhere to uh, pick up a child whatever it might be and to just realize that we all have a role to play in making our voices heard and in ultimately asking for more responsible practices but also in supporting um, companies who do seek to change and who do seek to do better and who want to change the paradigm of how mining is done. Excellent. Pamela, you get to have the last word, kind of. Oh, no. <laughs> I think you knew that I might challenge this question a little bit, so <laughs> save it for later. Actually, it somewhat dovetails on what Rebecca was saying, and my challenge is to the research community, because I think this is something that is necessary for everyone. And I would love to see a study that is done that can quantify the minerals, let's say, since I'm in Europe, every European would need throughout, you know, further life, but make very different assumptions and make these very clear and address this whole post kind of, you know, post materialism debate. Um, so do we need new smartphones every two years or can we keep them for 10 years? I mean, do we, you know, to start to make trade offs going to the last question clear and to start kind of thinking in a new way but also i think in europe the case has not been made for mining pure and simple and if you want to make the case you need to know what we need of each specific commodity and if we know that it's not going to be exact but you can start discussing so that would be my wish lovely um thank you very much for taking time out in your afternoons thank you for everybody who's attending um also a little as they say, shout out to my co-host, Marie Therese, who sort of remained this strong, silent partner in this entire endeavor um, and managed everything so I didn't have to worry about it. So a little round of applause for everyone. I hope the participants enjoyed or at least gained something from this. Um, please keep in touch with the project. We're, we're doing this for another two and a half years at least. Um, and we can put you in touch with any of the panelists specifically if you have more questions for them. Otherwise, um, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Bye bye. Thank you. All. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, thank you Masuma. Thank you so thank much. You so much.